Thanks for listening to The Derivative. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. March was a endogenous liquidity event, if anything, right? Everybody points to the COVID crash and everything, but, you know, COVID was the camel that brought, broke the straw's back. You know, it was like anything could have happened at this point. Any sort of movement in liquidity was going to create this cascade effect of degrossing or deleveraging the books. And that's what we really saw in March. And, and that's what, you know, exacerbated a lot of those moves. And that's what, you know, Adams was referencing with, you know, the bond t- ETFs. You know, having such a divergence is, is due to illiquidity. And when illiquidity hits those markets, we start seeing all of those correlation breaks or those correlations go to one. Um, and that's it's very fascinating that people find out what their what their diversification really is in an event like March. Hi, all. Quick note before we get started here. We had a great conversation with Adam and Jason going more than two hours uh, with the back half going deep into some philosophy on what the reality of money is, AI, Bitcoin and more. So sort of became two separate pods, and as such, we separated them. So here's the first half. Enjoy. Hello, everyone, and happy holidays. 2020 is nearly done. We made it somehow. And to celebrate, I've got two of my favorite minds on the pod today to discuss all the ins and outs, ups and downs, circles and squares, risks and rallies. Anything else? Like That's all I could come up with with uh, contrarian things of this crazy, crazy year. We've got Adam Butler, Chief Investment Officer of Resolve Asset Management, who also hosts the excellent Gestalt U podcast and the Happy Hour series, Resolve Riffs, uh, with many of our favorite alternatives minds on there. And Jason Buck, CIO of the Mutiny Fund, the first of its kind volatility trader, Fund of Funds, who also does some podcasting on the Mutiny podcast, as well as conduct uh, some great interviews on Real Vision. So welcome, guys. Thanks for being here. It's a great pleasure to be on your podcast again, as always. I know we the last time uh, you were on was live in Miami before when things were somewhat normal. That's right. It's almost um, inconceivable to think back to those times. You know, yeah. all of us marauding through Miami as though there wasn't the pandemic on the way, and uh, yeah, we were all I think about. Down. I was thinking about that earlier today too. We were talking about the year in review. I was like, wait, when's the last time? Oh yeah, we were all in Miami at the end of June, physically there for all the conferences. And then I believe uh, I believe Jeff Malik had quite the uh, quite the retort about the pandemic, Jeff. If you want to bring that one back yeah. up, well, yeah, I think we were all there, and there wasn't. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there wasn't like a huge feeling of like get in your bunker. This is going to get nasty, right? There was just kind of like, yeah, the virus is out there. I was telling people, yeah, I think that China would nuke like 20 million of its citizens before it let the virus get out into the greater world, which might not be the most PC thing I've ever said, but. <laughs> <laughs> on, on a public podcast, no less. Yeah, it was um, right. Sorry, uh, China, if you're monitoring this, don't don't nuke me. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it, it seemed like it, it would was, just be under control. We were all right? a there little was- bit like scratching our heads, if I recall, right? There was, it was certainly a topic of conversation and we were watching the market rocket higher, right? Day after day, it just kept, and, and there was this insane vol compression, right? So like the sharp, if I look back, the sharp ratio through through January and, and through like even late February was some silly astronomical number, like six or seven on the S&P. And, and uh, then boy, did we get some mean reversion. Yeah. And I think we were met with some guys in Hong Kong back there in February and they were like a little more worried about the, uh, the riots in Hong Kong. Like, doesn't that seem like 30 years ago, but um, there was like, well, though, it's a little more for us worried about those riots than the virus. I think that'll be contained. And, well, yeah. Remember when democracy mattered? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So let's talk about that. We never talk about so Jan and even into Feb, there was still, even though it was on people's radars, people were starting to sell. There was still some super cheap uh, convexity out there. And you could, if you had your timing right, um, you know, kind of buy that protection before everything hit the fan. 
Jason, you must have been lining up the stool and the rope by by mid February, man. Like <laughs> with that that crazy 2019 vault compression, and then it just sort of accelerated into Jan Feb. Exactly, and I think that um, this is what we talk about a lot lately: is the the, the market swings. Yeah, from vol compressed to vol expansion or explosion is faster than we've ever seen in markets. And that may be a harbinger of the markets to come. And I think, you know, if we, if we just started talking about the beginning of 2020, we may have to look at 2019 is like, if you looked at, you know, people trying to trade that volatility risk premium, you know, between implied and realized, and you look at the last, you know, three year trailing returns or rolling returns, you would have seen since 2012, it is just asymptotically <laughs> gone down to zero. So as, as the real pensions, you know, real money pensions, superannuation funds came in and started selling vol, it started compressed. They were reducing their own, volatility risk premium so that, you know, victim of their own success. And you saw it starting to touch on zero uh, Q3 of 2019. So you're starting to see that, like that compression of all, like we saw in 2017 and 2019. I mean, we had realized vols in the single digits, like that's insane. Right. And I remember even talking to like Hari Krishnan in January and February, when we were talking about being able to buy, you know, your, your more classical deep out of the money protection at maybe a negative 15 or negative 20% attachment point, you know, historically those have cost you three to 5% a year. But when Hari and I were talking about in January, it was like one and a half to two percent a year to buy protection. So either if you're you're spending it in you know a percentage of notional, you know you're getting it cheapest ever, or if you were just set a, a set it and forget it percentage every year, you were loading up on inventory in at the beginning of, you know in January of 2020. It's just and it's amazing. How do you view that of of the classic that everyone says complacency? So people just weren't buying up protection; they weren't bidding up prices, or the supply, like all these pensions, everyone's saying, Hey, I need yield and I'm, I'm selling it. So I'm pushing on the, uh, sell yeah. side demand that kept the price low. I think there's two things on that. Um, one is I think when people, the, the first one, when you're saying about supply demand, we think about that when we have like zero sum markets and, and participants are, 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 are set off against each other. But as we know, with, uh, with options markets, you're going to have the dealers in between. And so you can have this crazy supply coming from like the pension funds, of, of selling volatility. And that doesn't pass directly through to the other side. It's got to go through the dealers first. And so that's what you're saying. Like you're pushing on that string is like, they're the victims of their own success as, as more and more pensions start doing the same things. You just have this amazing amount of supply of selling volatility, which is going to suppress that, you know, on, on a, on a go forward basis. And so, I mean, Adam might look at the same or slightly differently, but. Yeah. I mean, this, that's, that's not, the lens through which we typically view things. But I have to say that we have increasingly been trying to use those lenses to try and get a hold on the dynamics that are driving market moves, especially in the sort of intermediate term. Um, and obviously the open interest in individual equities and in index options over the last 18 months or so has just skyrocketed. I mean, we've, I don't think we've ever seen open interest, especially on call option on individual names in the S&P. I mean, we've exceeded all records by quite a substantial margin. If, if um, what I'm seeing is uh, representative, it's, it's, been, it's been shocking. So certainly the options market, you know, it, there's been talk over the last several months about how the um, options market is the tail that wags the market dog. And, um, you know, I was skeptical of that as, as you know, as recently as a, as a few months ago, and I've become increasingly persuaded of the important role of, of options, especially in, in terms of uh, how it impacts moves in the market over, over horizons and on measured in days and weeks. But I think, let's, Jeff, I know that you, uh, you're going to find that Adam does a great segue to what you're going to talk about later before you yeah. get and he's, he's the best at it. But, but it made me think about two things I want to go back a little bit is um, I remember what I want to say is like, it, it's, it's easy to think about it is, is if we take a poetic license with Hyman Minsky, right? Is stability creates volatility. Like the longer that volatility gets suppressed, the more you're building up that air pocket for, for volatility to explode. And there's no way of uh, maybe as accurately timing that, but it's, it's a weird uh, perversion to think about that in a counterfactual that the more stability reigns supreme, the more you're building up that cash of volatility to come, you know, rapidly into the marketplace. And what, why do these pensions just keep falling into the same trap? Like they know, right? They've read the papers, they've seen the things. Like why are they? And they're not just selling naked puts, right? So are they getting duped into new complex structures that are actually short gamma way out of the money, and they sure, don't so realize it, or are they just accepting that risk 
and knowing like, hey, I know that there's that risk, but I just want to grab that yield in the meantime. Maybe the risk doesn't hit for two or three more years. This is your cue to go into how vol is the only risk premium. Jason. Yeah. Just, so just, just go for that, man. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go for that. But, and Adam talks more maybe pensions than I do, at least the, uh, on a certain side of it. But the way um, the way we learn about it, the way we talk to the pensions is that, you know, they, they have consultants and that's what people don't realize. There's, there's a whole CYA industry of consultants that sell the pensions. And part of it is they sell, they go back and look at a back test and go look from 20, 2009 to 2012, you should have been selling volatility. That was the right thing to do. And they go to show them this back test, but they start telling them this in you know, 2012, right? It takes till about 2015 before it goes through all the machination of the pensions before they approve it, right? But meanwhile, this consultant's been selling this to every pension. And he's been telling them, look, you don't need to do much, maybe a few percentage points, maybe five, 10% max of your book, but they're not thinking about the aggregate amount of pensions they're talking to. So they all start moving these, they're, you know, there's these ocean liners that can only move so quickly or turn so quickly. So it takes them years to get approvals to put this on their books. And then they don't realize the aggregate exposures that they're creating, but also in their defense, let's be honest, you know, everybody wanted to rip Alberta, whoever they lost $2 billion, but it was on a yeah, two. I was going to bring that to the Canadian of like, they, they didn't blow up. Maybe it's not a bad thing for them to have that in the portfolio. On the $200 billion book, two billions, nothing. I mean, Grant, and it, you know, those are you're you're losing people's real pension assets, so they should never do that, right? But it's not a big of a deal as people go, oh my God, the headline number is two billion. Let's put that in a little bit of context. And I think that um, Adam may spend more time talking to pensions, so he can give you some more insight on how they work. But that's the kind of that's the way we look at it, in a, in a, in a at a high level. Well, I think we need to be charitable in how we judge these institutions because. I mean, think about this problem and we don't have this problem when we don't target people who have this problem typically, right? But if you're swinging a 50, 100, 200 billion dollar um, asset base around, then your options of how you're going to cobble together premia in order to meet your liabilities and just your, your um, cash flow streams in the intermediate term are just extraordinarily few. You know, I mean, really, when you're 50 or $100 billion, you are the market. Any yeah. active risk you might try to put on is going to have the most vanishingly small impact on your uh, total P&L. And so what they, what they need to do is go out across all conceivable risk premia, spread their bets in every, in every corner of the market that might deliver them a few basis points of excess returns. Um, volatility risk premium is, and we can get into the, the philosophy and the, the theory of, of to what extent the, the VRP permeates all of the other risk premia or, or many others. But, but, you know, they sort of view this as one premia in an arsenal of different premia, and they're just trying to spread their bets. Like you say, it, it was a $2 billion loss on a $200 billion book. Um, it's, it's really awful optics. It's terrible line item risk. Um, but from their point of view, it, they're just they're spreading their bets and, and they sort of expect a few of them to go pear shaped in any given three to five year period. And obviously, this was some egg on, on the face for Alberta and, and a couple of people got got the axe because of that. But really, they, they can't really be faulted. Sure, they can be faulted in execution. They can be faulted in not understanding the reflexive nature of if everybody piles into the same premia, then what should we expect from the premium, both in terms of the expected return, but also in terms of the expected risk that we're taking by all, pi all piling into the same um, uh, sources of, of risk and return. And, um, you know, know. Very, like you say, when you sort of consolidate the advice industry with three or four primary consulting firms, everybody else, er everybody ends up on the same side of the trade. And, and uh, this is how things go very wrong. Um, real quick, I'll give you a chance. Plug, was, what was that with Wayne Himmelsign or another one you had where you guys were going into the hole? They're too big. They can't even access this tail risk stuff. They can't even access. So what, do you remember which episode that was? Yeah, that was two or three episodes ago on um, Resolve Riffs. We had Wayne on and um, just going through their strategy, which is, is primarily um, tail hedge oriented. And just talking about the size of institutions that might be able to benefit from this type of strategy and how you would layer on a tail hedge for an institution with 
a 50 or $100 billion equity book. And I think we all agreed that uh, these institutions are just are, are too big to hedge. And, yeah. um, I, you know, we went on to discuss why, you know, smaller investors, and when I say smaller, I mean, very large family offices on the order of, you know, a billion or, or a few billion in, in assets have a lot of options in this regard, right? You've got a lot, a lot of options of, of different types of premia that you can chase yeah, no, and kind of different sand. types of risk management uh, strategies that you can put on that these huge pensions and huge endowments just can't. And you should be t- making use of all these tools. And yet they model themselves often after the huge endowment. So that's the mismatch, right? Of like, no, exactly. you have much more nimbleness, use it. And two yeah. more things before, I, Jason, you're going to jump. Like to me, the issue is not necessarily that you lost $2 billion, but you caused, right? Like what did they lose on the whole portfolio? So because that was there and because it started to cascade, you lost, who knows what it was, 15 20% on the $200 billion. So that's a little bit of game theory, right? If only I had it, it's not going to cause it. But if everyone has it. Uh, and then the flip side of that, not to pick on the Canadians, was... Calpers, right? Who got rid of their tail hedge rate in January or whatever that was, yep. which was an, another terrible headline. Which again, you know, obviously a, an awful decision in retrospect, an awful decision if you're being more thoughtful about the um, the nature of your liabilities and what the assets are there for and the types of things that can go wrong. But at the same time, you've got an investment committee that needs to to answer to a board of directors. They are seeing a line item that needs to be re-upped every month or every quarter. It's a consistent loser on the um, on the balance sheet, and you've got a, a CEO or an investment committee that's got to come back and explain the nature of this expense every quarter. And you can just imagine that they keep getting heat. This is the um, the stool and rope that I was talking about with Jason earlier, right? I mean, everybody who was in the business of risk management coming into January, February of this year was ready to commit Harry Carey because all of the risks that they have been uh, discussing as being things that people need to think about hedging hadn't materialized in years. Yeah. And yeah. Um, Except and for one day in all... February of 2018. Right? Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, as usual, all the chickens come home to roost at once. And um, so everybody has a, a chance for a day in the sun. And what Adam and I've talked about privately a lot, and I think this is very interesting, is like we've both been very charitable towards these, you know, $200 billion books. Like you literally cannot hedge the notional value of that. So everybody that wants to point <clears throat> fingers at them and say they should have hedged their books and everything, it's like you have to understand what level of the game you're playing and what the constraints are. I mean, it's ridiculous. But on the flip side of that, what I think um, Adam and the team at Resolve have been really pounding the drum for in the last few months, especially, is that these can be benefits if you're capacity constrained, if you're a lower size fund, you have time arbitrage, you have, you know, you have liquidity arbitrage that these big funds can get into a lot of the strategies you can get into. So you have a lot more opportunity set than they would. And so you can now compete them if you're a smaller fund. And, and that's kind of the way people should look at it. And part of that um, leading to what happened in 2020 is maybe it was just in our corner of the, of the FinTwit verse, but you had, you know, AQR and, and Nassim Taleb, you know, you had Cliff and Nassim going at it on Twitter, but part of it is like, they were both right. Right. Like Nassim's right. You should hedge your book. And if you don't have portfolio insurance, you don't have a portfolio. But heard, also, was, that, was, was that okay. after the crash? I remember that slightly, but I can't remember yeah. it exactly. Yeah. But Cliff was right too. Is like, if you're a $200 billion fund, you can't do that. So you're going to probably use more of a trend following approach. So it's like, they're both right, but it was just, it was an enjoyable part of the, the, the Fintuit sphere for while it was going on. And we would love to think that a $200 billion fund might be able to make effective use in, in, at scale of even a long-term trend following strategy. But the, yeah, you know, I'm, even, I'm even skeptical that, that they can make material effective use of, of even that type of risk management technique. You know, the, the two things that we always harp on as being the primary advantages of smaller investors. And again, when I say smaller, I mean measured in single digit billions uh, yeah. and not double digit or triple digit billions, right? right. But we're what these smaller investors have- Rich, rich dentists, we're talking- a, Well, yeah, but rich, rich dentists else. can benefit too, right? But yeah. but up up to sort of the, the two to five to, to you know, whatever single digit billion range is you've got mandate flexibility. In other words, you have the ability to change your investment policy and you can, or change your, your portfolio um, to suit different objectives, to suit changes in views. 
you can you can you can shift your mandate. These big pensions, in order to change their policy portfolio, is a multi-quarter, probably multi-year process involving a very large number of stakeholders, all of which have a great deal of risk involved in providing any latitude whatsoever. Like it's just an almost impossible task. Yeah. And the other thing you've got is portfolio agility, right? You can move substantial portions of your portfolios around relatively quickly with just with fairly minor market impact. And so, you know, you can chase a much wider variety of active strategies, place a much wider variety of higher frequency active bets to take advantage. And, and look, the information ratio that you can extract from the market is a function of the number of active bets that you can take. It's the diversity of the bets and the, and, and the frequency of them. So obviously you can make more bets on, on a wider array of, of instruments more frequently with a smaller portfolio and, and investors with smaller portfolios should, should be making uh, as much use of those advantages as they have the expertise to, to target. Here, here. So let's shift gears a little and talk. We'll, we'll let the institutions off the hook for a minute and talk um, like, so March full on capitulation, um, what were some of the craziest stats or environments, things you were seeing in real time as we were in those, uh, in the throes of that going into the third week of March? Can One I... of the major memories for me was, was a, a break in the nav of some of the treasury funds, uh, the yeah. treasury ETFs. I mean, I remember the iShares 20 plus year treasury ETF trading at a 7% discount to nav. So you could buy the ETF and short the, the underlying treasuries and earn a risk-free 7%, assuming that markets normalized in any, to, to any extent. But I mean- And treasuries, just, we're talking, not high treasuries. yield or yeah. corporate. Correct. Yeah. yeah, which in I theory, mean, you should have been able to access and, and sell. Definitely, yeah. I mean, when you've got broker dealers and, and firms like Citadel and, and uh, some of the higher frequency players that, that cannot access the margin to arbitrage what is essentially a risk-free bet at yeah. a seven percent discount that is really stressed liquidity conditions where was warren buffett you think he would have he would have said cool i want i want half that seven percent um what were you going to say jason no i think it's a good point to stress the liquidity conditions i was i was actually going to take a step back for a second and just talk about that March was a endogenous liquidity event, if anything, right? Everybody points to the COVID crash and everything, but, you know, COVID was the camel that brought, broke the straws back. You know, it was like anything could have happened at this point. Any sort of movement in liquidity was going to create this cascade effect of degrossing or deleveraging the books. And that's what we really saw in March. And, and that's what, you know, exacerbated a lot of those moves. And that's what, you know, Adams was referencing with, you know, the bond T ETFs you know, having such a divergence is, is due to illiquidity. And when illiquidity hits those markets, we start seeing all of those correlation breaks or those correlations go to one. Um, and that's, it's very fascinating to people find out what their, what their diversification really is in an event like March. And I'm, I'm more curious about how Adam saw it when they have like a, uh, some of their funds that are like, you know, targeting, you know, a portfolio of volatility or anything, and you have to kind of degross those books rapidly, you know, it's another speaks to the nimbleness of being smaller. You can get out that fire exit faster, but like it, that's, that's gotta be uh, quite nerve wracking when you're sitting in that seat in, in March. Well, it's, it's a funny thing because yeah, we're smaller, but you know that we're not the only player that is, that's using this type of strategy, right? So we're swinging a few um, hundred million around uh, which if it was just us, we could descale really simply with very little impact in almost any market condition. But there are other funds that are much, much larger than us that are also trying to manage their risk book and, uh, and using approximately the same type of metrics and specifications and mechanics in order to do so. And um, so- Can you, can you, you give us 30 seconds that. on what that looks like? We're talking more of a risk parity kind of rebalancing. Well, any, any type of fund that, um, I mean, so, so the basic fundamental um, building block here is it goes all the way back to the 50s. The idea is you build the optimal portfolio, the optimal portfolio when you're dealing with, you know, five or six dozen different global markets often is so diversified that it has a very low volatility and commensurately uh, without any leverage, a very low expected return, but yeah. it's still the optimal portfolio according to your estimates. 
And so, so you simply need to scale it along the capital market line. Um, so you borrow to just invest more in this risky portfolio in order to generate your target return, right? So you're, you're running with a little bit of leverage. You're relying on diversification. Um, you're measuring the diversification opportunity uh, regularly in the market, right? You measure it every day. How are correlations changing? How are volatilities changing? Um, some other guiding factors. What is the shape and, and curvature and, and um, uh, level of, of some of the volatility indices, these types of, of inputs, right? But you've got some kind of model that tells you how much risk you've got in the book. And as risk increases, correlations in many markets come in um, and volatility escalates, then you need to lower your exposure in order to maintain your target risk over time. And um, so, not so a good way to say that. If I put the portfolio together, I come up with a, a 10 vol. I lever it up. I'm at a 10 vol. Everything's normal. If correlations move and vol moves, now the portfolio is at a 50 vol. Probably yeah. not that extreme, but say 20 vol. Hey, that's two times more risky. And I want, I need to cut the leverage in half to get back in line. Yeah. And there's, there's this really strange nonlinearity. Like the, the move, if you're at 10, if you're estimating, let's just use the S&P for, for example. So the, let's say the S&P had currently over the last, you know, whatever, 60 days or however we're measuring volatility um, has a volatility of 10%, just keep the math in, easy, right? And it goes to 12%. Well, that's a 20% increase yeah. in volatility. We've got to descale the portfolio by a commensurate amount. If the vol is 30%, and it, and it goes to 32%, well, that's a much, much smaller percentage um, reduction, right? So, so things get extra tricky when vol yeah. is really low because the, the movement in volatility has a much larger impact per point on the amount of scaling that you need to, to exert on the portfolio in one direction or the other. And so the liquidity that's required for you to change your exposure when volatility is very low is different than the liquidity that's required when volatility is high. So there's some there's some other sort of nonlinearities. And in, in would it be things. fair to say that's somewhat of a knock on risk parity type models and vol targeting type models that they have to sell into the sell off and they kind of crystallize some losses? Yeah, it's well, it's it's in, in a lot of ways it's it's like um, only put options, you know, but but it's or portfolio insurance. Like they're all the same type of right. um, of right. Do you want your cost and, up front or your cost on the back end? Yeah, or or like or stop losses, you know, like they're they're all sort of they're all sort of similar. The idea is you're just you're trying to manage risk, um, but really what you're trying to do is is target risk, and and when you're targeting risk, that that is very useful and, and beneficial most of the time. And I mean, what was so interesting about the March episode was that vol escalated and markets collapsed at over twice the rate that those events had ever happened before. I mean, even if you go back to the 1987 portfolio insurance event um, on October 19th, 1987, that was uh, previous to this, the fastest sell-off in, in market history. And before that, it was the 1929 Black Monday crash. Well, that had those crashes had absolutely nothing on the March crash, right? So you, you needed to be able to model or anticipate a vol event that was twice as extreme as anything that you'd ever observed in history. And I think that speaks to the value of the types of strategies that Jason's firm offers. And then part of it, like every strategy has its downside. So that's just part of life is that almost insult to injury is when that liquidity event happens and people are just throwing out the baby at the bathwater. Everybody's just going to cash. So they get rid of things they really want. So normally in a risk parity or a permanent portfolio or something, you know, a, a good holistic portfolio, you have all these offsetting return drivers, but when liquidity dries up like that, all of a sudden your stocks, bonds, gold, and even if your commodity trend look back, it's not fast enough, like everything's going out at once. And so the things that were providing a ballast previously are not like, like it's just gotta be just hair raising in that environment. Yeah, I mean the the period between uh, March nineteenth and March twenty third was was very very interesting, right? Because you had prior to that, liquidity conditions were sufficient that treasuries, gold, um, equities, um, rates, everything that in the portfolio in the prosperity portfolio was doing what it you expected to do, right? Treasuries were were rising 
uh, sufficiently to offset a significant proportion of the losses in some of the more cyclically sensitive commodities and equity markets. Gold was still relatively buoyant, acting as a ballast, as you'd expect. Um, what happened on the 19th was that liquidity conditions dried up so much, and the margin clerks took over and and instructed everybody to have to sell whatever they could sell. And so that's when you saw um, uh, firms selling treasuries, selling gold, selling everything they could because that was the only thing that they were able to sell. You weren't able to sell any of your individual equities. There was no bid, right? So you went in and sold whatever you could sell for the time when the margin clerks took over and, and, and ran the show. And then of course, you had the stabilizing force of the Fed um, coming in and saying that they were gonna buy um, more bonds, they were going to step in and, and set up structures to buy corporate credit. And, and all of a sudden there was this reversal. And I mean, the reversal was, if anything, uh, maybe even more surprising in its uh, extremity than the sell-off um, due to this major re reversal by by the Fed and the preceding vol and liquidity so quickly. So just I'll put a bow on risk parity, then we move on. But so not you guys in particular, but overall risk parity space, it was a tough March and a tough 2020. Well, actually, I, I would say it was a rough four days in March. Okay. And and uh, I think if you look across most of the risk parity funds, except for those four days in March, they behaved pretty well like you'd expect. You know, some of them that were a little bit more equity heavy. Yeah. Um, did a little worse. Some of them that were a little bit more bond heavy did a little better. Um, most of them have recovered to new highs on the year and have participated in um, a good chunk of the rally. And, and now that we've started to see a shift where markets are beginning to take notice of foreign equity indices and commodities, which typically happens as- What are those? There's foreign equity indices? I know. Yeah. <laughs> who, who knew? Right. Right. Uh, these, that these poor, neglected emerging markets, European markets, uh, Japan, these tend to outperform during uh, periods where, where investors are anticipating uh, an upward shock in inflation. And, and I think we're, we're seeing that type of scenario play out right now. Obviously, you're seeing a widening out of the rally. Some of these big value funds have started to, to, to be resuscitated. And um, commodities have started to come to life, right? The energy sector has just had a massive rebound, even though we had a, a, a pretty substantial surprise build in crude inventories last week, the energy sector has proved resilient. And I mean, it's it's pretty remarkable to see that the strength in not just the, the underlying commodities, but also some of these commodity sectors that have just been wrecked over the last so, three to five years uh, come back to life. Jason, you got something to say, or can I ask you on the vault? I want to know which flavors of vol did best in March? Or, or uh, yeah, so it, was, it was a complex question. I was just, I was just thinking about uh, Adam being the Segway master and leading you into your oil trade next, but yeah, actually yeah. I actually wanted to jump forward before we jump back. Adam, because so we can tie up a bow on the, on the vol targeting at the portfolio level. Mm -hmm. Have you seen now as we get into late 2020 that the people are uh, re-leveraging their books depending on their look back because March has kind of rolled off a lot of people's look backs on, on risk parity. Are you seeing risk parity kind of re-leveraging their books across the board? Or obviously it depends on, you know, individual funds, but is that what you're starting to see or? Well, pairwise correlations haven't really diverged the way that we were seeing in, in late 2019 and early 2020. And, you know, the vol complex is still not giving uh, trend funds and risk parity funds, some of the other vol targeting funds, uh, the same room to breathe as we had in, in, in 2019. So it's, um, you know, we aren't. We just aren't seeing a recovery in equity positioning, typically, or risk-on type positioning, in a lot of these funds. I know where our exposure is lower than it had been, um, and we, we, you know, we've we've changed our our approach relatively uh, pretty significantly over the last six or eight months as well. So I'm not sure it's apples to apples, but um, just in general, I think we are seeing trend funds and some of the other vol targeting and diversified risk parity type funds um, hanging back in terms of their overall aggregate exposure at the moment. There may come a time, I expect there will, before whatever this is, let's call it a mini cycle, um, comes comes to a turn. But uh, at the moment, I, I don't see that we're in sort of danger territory for, for general exposure in the vol targeting space. 
And then, so Jeff, to answer your question on the long volatility terrorist side, it was actually like a, a story of weeks, right? At the sell off, you know, yeah. you had that last week of February, um, you know, where maybe some of the, you know, some of the options started to uh, started to look a little bit, you know, they started to pop, they started to look a little rich, but you mainly had like people like the trend followers and short futures started to really, um, you know, short the market going into the last week of February. So they start doing well, you know, as, as the weeks pass, then, you know, maybe you had a, um, you know, first week or second week into March, the vol of all picks up and the market starts whipping back around in, in like Adam referenced, like you had the market, you know, popping back up 10% in a day. Like you just had, you know, markets whipping around. So then the ARB managers have a really target rich environment. They're doing well. And then you get in the second, third week uh, of March when the market really starts tanking off. Then you have those deep out of the money, you know, put options. You're going through those strikes. Those are really starting to pay off. So it was more of like a, a tale of weeks as you saw, like the markets moving around and the different strategies kind of, they're overlapping a little bit, but some are picking off the, the different trades here and there and, you know, how you could, you know, manage that risk throughout the month of, you know, when the market rips back in your face 10% in a day, that's, that's pretty tough for everybody. And it seemed the, there was some high variance between managers in the tail space, right? Because it was all about monetization. So if you're yes. holding 12 month puts, you know, December puts in March, what do you do? Do you get out of them? Do you hold them? Um, what, what did that look like in terms of the different managers and how they monetize? Yeah. To your point is like, you have, you know, Adam referenced earlier is if, if you have a, a one-year option and then you have drift for like February, or March, and the market drifts higher and then takes off, you might not hit your strike. So you might've, you might've worked your way right out of a strike. Um, you know, the, the shorter term, you know, it's, it's all about your monetization heuristics. And so, you know, volatility can cluster or it can mean revert. And it can mean revert so quickly, you didn't monetize any of those profits. And so you had certain funds that were on the tail risk side, you know, when the market got down to 35% down, they could have been up 40 to 60%, but the market finished the month only 12.4% down. So like they, they, that mean reverted all the way back in and some funds were only up 12.8. So it's, it's just like, it's, if you can cross margin. Right, and others, book, others monetize way early, right? The first yeah. or second week of March. And then they were sitting there in week three, like, oh no, what did I do? I missed yeah, out on, you, yeah. you don't know, right? Like, is, is this the big one or is it not? So do I monetize early or is it going to mean revert? So I maybe have to monetize so it mean reverts. If this is the big one, I have to hold for that monetization. And then, okay, it passes through 35% down. Is this the big one? Do I monetize? Okay. What if there's a second leg down after? I need still something on the books because otherwise I'm going to pay up for that inventory now. Like it's just a, it's a nightmare of monetization. And that's why, you know, we look at it as a, across the board of different heuristics for monetization because you don't really know what that path dependency is going to look like. And so it's really easy to put on these options trade. It's the monetization, the managing and the role that are exceedingly difficult. Well, the, um, I, I think Brandon. also just to just to make sure we we uh, we get out of that everything there is to get the um, I think it shouldn't be undersold just how remarkable the contrast was between that first what was it maybe thirty or thirty five trading days of the year with such a huge run higher in the S and P right so so options um, hedgers need to continue to roll their strikes higher or they get further out of the money before they they see a payout. So ha having to, and, it, and it's exactly the same problem as the trend followers have where, you know, your, your, um, the risk in your trade is a function of how far out of the money your reversal is, yeah, your right? distance like if, to your stop, essentially. Correct, correct. And so, so that huge run up was such a massive confounding variable for any type of hedging strategy. And you know, the the both both that and the speed of the sell off and the speed of the snapback, well, I think were the were the primary variables responsible for such a high dispersion in not just tail hedge funds, but also trend following funds, which I, I think is worth also discussing their performance. Yeah, I want, that was going to be my next. And I, I'll just bring in that, right? If you had tested your vol strategy, your tail strategy since 09 to 19, you're going to monetize super quick, right? Because it snaps back in days, not mm -hmm. weeks, not months, days. Yeah. So then you'd be getting out in week two or, you know, week one or two. And here we are, then it goes right through that. And to your point, Jason, like, oh no, this is the real one. This is the big yeah. one. And then, nope, not really. We're going to snap back. 
So yeah, so sorry, go ahead. Then I'm gonna ask Adam about trend. But yeah, because I'll, I'll lead to that, but also tell three stories about those trades that I think are really fascinating. And part of the one with like with trend, right, is they got sold after two, two, 2008 on crisis alpha, but because it was a long drawn out recession, they were crisis alpha and you didn't see that in this, this really quick one in March. So that Adam can speak to that. But I think about three trades that may tell this story that are quite interesting. And, and going back to what Adam was saying is like the first you know month and a half, the first 35 trading days, the market was grinding higher. And so what, one of the trades we were watching that was fascinating to us was the, um, the structured products coming out of Asia and Europe, right? And so a lot of them, these had a, a knock-in or knock-out adoption at, at a negative 30% drawdown to the S&P. And you go, well, in March, the S&P sold off 35%, so they should have kicked in. Well, it depends on the vintage that they were created, right? So if it was January 1st, they were created and the market drifted higher before it sold off, you never touched those strikes. So we were waiting to see if you got this cascade of structured products knocking in would have just been unbelievable, but very few of them got touched. And, and in the meanwhile, it's also exacerbating the sell-off was the banks actually hedging out some of that risk, you know, as, as their Delta hedging that, that made it a little more, you know, explain, sharper. explain real quick what those look like from a client perspective. So I buy these knockout options, I get some yield. And then if it goes down 30%, I lose 30%. So it's like, give me yeah. 8% a year, but if it goes 30, I lose 30. Yeah, say I'm just a, a retail uh, investor in, in Japan. I go to my local bank, uh, typically a French bank for some reason. And then the, uh, <laughs> they say, you know, you're used to getting yield on like bonds. We'll, we'll provide you a yield of 6% a year. And they say, great, I'll take it. But they don't read the fine print that says they give them those because they have a knock-in option at negative 30% of a worst of usually scenario between, you know, the cost B, the Hang Seng and the S&P you know, or whatever it is. So if, if, if the market does not drop below 30%, they keep getting their 6% annual yield. But if it drops below that, they get knocked in at that level. And so that, that's the difficulty of these structured products. They own products, the market at that level or they lose 30%? They lose 30%. Got it. You basically- right, Sorry, get, I, I derailed you. Yeah. So that's the backdrop. Tons of these things are sold for some reason, mostly in Asia, some in Europe. Yeah. And so- we were waiting to see some of those in, in the cascade that could have happened when those got knocked in, but very few of them did. So that was interesting. A lot of them, those are still sitting out there. Um, the second trade that was interesting is what uh, people call Bill Ackman's, you know, greatest trade ever, right? And it's interesting, like we always say you can't really time portfolio insurance, but I think Bill kind of proved you can. But it's interesting, the actual mechanics behind it, and that might explain it better to people, is, you know, he's sitting there in February worrying about this huge equity book he's got. And like most people with this are just primarily equity traders or long equity, he's thinking, okay, maybe I need to start selling off some of this book. And that's how I can reduce my risk in case anything bad happens from this, this COVID pandemic. And instead of doing that, he thought maybe I can actually hedge this with CDS. So he bought CDS on a, a basket of corporate bonds, right? In mid-February. Now that CDS was going to cost him, he bought, I think it was close to $70 billion worth of notional protection, right? And he bought it for his monthly carry was 27 million a month. So he starts off the first month, you know, mid February, he's got to pay 27 million that month for that protection. It just so happens that he can roll out of that in the second to third week of March. Yeah. Right. So he didn't even hold it for 30 days. So he had $27 million outlay and he brought in 2.7 billion of that $70 billion notional. Right. Good trade. And he, he put that trade on though, that people don't realize he didn't put that trade on because it's the greatest trade ever. And he wanted to put on a CDS trade. He did it to hedge his equity book. I think he was sitting on about 7 billion roughly in equity. So he and just so it was, he it was thought a, of it as the cheapest way to hedge of like, right, Hey, these a, puts have gotten expensive. This, the CDS looks like a good spot. Exactly. Well, none those of the spreads haven't widened out yet. Exactly. And it, well, it goes back to Adam's thing earlier too. It was also a function of uh, ability to get a trade on and you can get it on in CDS in that size. He took a $70 billion notional position. And like, at least he had the humility to, to, to tell people too, like if it had rolled on for another few months, he would have had his pony up 27 million a month, every month. So the exponential return wouldn't have looked as good. It was it still would have been more fun if he came in and bought 70 billion worth of VIX futures. <laughs> exactly. that, that would have made things a lot more fun. Right. So this one I think is interesting because the reason I'm also telling the story. So is that somebody that had timing luck. And he admits to that, which is fantastic. But more importantly, we have to think about how it hedged his equity book. Because this is one thing that Adam and I are both big fans of is uh, rebalancing premium and having negatively correlated assets or uncorrelated assets. And how do you hedge out your risks? And so that one was interesting because then it allowed him on March 23rd, he started buying back up all those names in his equity book. And now at a lower NAV position. 
So he's going to compound his wealth so much greater because he had this hedge on that gave him a convex cash position and he rolled those profits into his equity positions at a lower nav point. So it was a, it was a brilliant trade on more on the, the equity hedge than anything else. The other trade to think about that made a lot of headlines in March is Universa and Martz Vixnagel. You know, you got all these headlines that they had a 4,000% return. So I was getting all these DMs like, how does somebody make a 4,000% return? Right. I and know. So they if lose 100% a year for the last eight years. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so if you think about what Universa does, they hedge out the notional exposure of institutional clients. So let's say I come to Universa and I've got a $100 million equity position. They say, if you can pay us, you know, 3% premium a year, we'll hedge out that risk beyond a negative 15 or negative 20% attachment point move in the S&P. Great. You put that on. So for the last 12 years, you've been paying this like 3% bleed every year and nothing has happened for you to get a trigger. Then the March sell-off happens, right? They start to see a payout on those options. And then they cover the risk you had on that $100 million notion actually exposure. So if you just think about it, and I'm just using rough numbers, and it's a lot more nuanced than that. But if you think about if it was 3%, 3.6% you know, on an annualized basis, you're paying 30 bips a month if you're putting on monthly uh, put options, and that was your premium. You're paying 30 bips a month, right? So if you think about it, if I put on 30 bips a month in March, and then it's up 4,000% on that one month's premium, that's going to give me a 12% return, right? So in March, Universa was up 12.8%. Well, the market was down 12.4%. So they were up 40 bips net net. Congratulations. They did their job. They hedged your book. Yeah. But that's not a 4,000% return the way any, any rational person would look at it. Right. And what a party paper you are. You know, that, that, the 4,000 sounded way more fun. Yeah. yeah that, I think my favorite headline was Goat Herder makes 4,000% return because he, <laughs> he, he has a goat farm in Northern Michigan. But, it was, but they did their job. Like they did an amazing job, but like it's not that. But also, you know, like we said before, there was probably a point, you know, mid month where their book was probably up 35, 36%, 40% mm -hmm. or because of the expansion eight, and then 12, contraction. percent right. Yeah, exactly. Um, I love so it. So you're saying he, they actually were underachievers. <laughs> yeah. But, they, they, they were meet, they Let's were see who else we can offend right? on this. Just kidding. Yeah, for sure, We've for got sure. the French, the uh, Canadians, the Chinese, the consultants. We've offended um, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to bring it back to Trend, Adam. So how did Trend perform? As Jason alluded to, it was kind of too fast of a move for classic 08 style Trend performance. What did you see in your trend roots? Um, so, I mean, obviously, I'm gonna I'm gonna ping this back to you because I'm sure you've got lots of good comments on this too. But um, I think what struck me was just the amazing dispersion in um, in performance across all the different trend funds. You know, and and there've been I, I was watching um, a panel from several prominent trend fund managers from Nordia uh, last week or the week before. And there's been all these kinds of reports and panels and whatever podcasts with, with trend managers. And I mean, it, it came down to what type of trend, right? Are, is breakout trend or time series momentum type stuff? Um, do you have stops or not? Um, do, do you trade full positions daily or do you, do you sort of smooth it out as more of a risk premium style strategy? Right to accommodate more um, more assets. So what you had was smaller funds that are more nimble and are, are able to trade full positions, um, like in a single trade, and that had either shorter term break breakout or shorter term based you know look back type strategies fared um, much better. Some of them fared quite well, and then other managers that had longer term look backs or um, Use tranched type trading in order to accommodate larger, um, larger AUM, um, and weren't able to move fast enough for the fastest crash in history. Uh, didn't do near so, nearly so well. But it, it really you can map this to an option profile where shorter term trend is is analogous to shorter term puts, right? And therefore or you've got more more at the money, too. more at the money, higher gamma, higher exposure to. Um, major explosions involve. And um, so as a function of that, you know, if you look at the, the profile of rolling long uh, put strategies over the, uh, the long term, the 
obviously the return profile of that is very negative, right? That's a, that's a um, negative carry strategy and typically extra short term trend strategies, certainly over the last 10 or 15 years have had either negative or very, very small positive carry, right? They've been very unattractive to, yeah. to hold as a, as a long-term strategic allocation. Whereas the longer term strategies um, have that. Okay. Right. If you're thinking about sort of one year or longer uh, trend look backs, these types of strategies have done better because they more approximate a typical long beta exposure. Um, so they're more capturing drift than they are capturing any sort of gamma. And so, you know, they just don't have that negative carry. In fact, they may have some sort of small, small positive carry over the long term. So if you happened to be a firm that could suffer through this negative carry on extra short look back high gamma type trend strategies for the last five or six years, you're probably in a 20, 30, 40% drawdown position on this strategy. Um, and you were able to benefit from the, the exposure to that at the exact right time. So kudos to you. That was what the strategy was for. You ate the, the drawdown and you reaped the benefits. And as Jason alluded to, then we're and able you to don't renounce exist. into your, into your core positions at the right time. And, and that worked out very well. I suspect very, very few institutions or investors were able to stick with that. On the other hand, you've got the longer term strategies, which have a higher long term sharp ratio. They're easier to stick with. They resemble more of a sort of typical risk, risk premia type profile. Yeah. Um, the sad thing is people were, I think, expecting them to ask, act like crisis alpha and they just weren't designed to act like cri crisis alpha in this type of drawdown, right? In a 2008 or 2000 style bear market drawdown, I think these strategies would have served their, that purpose. But in this type of crash, they're just not designed to do it. And, and so I think there's just a mismatch in objectives and expectations. Um, and if yeah, you want to earn that crisis alpha, premium when the crisis hits, you got to eat that negative premium over the, over the long term when, the, when there is not no crisis period for a while. Yeah. And which we've written a lot about of like negative correlation versus non-correlation. People are buying non-correlation and expecting negative correlation. Yeah. That, I mean, risk premium typically is a, they're uncorrelated typically, right? If you yeah. do it right, they sort of have on average zero correlation, but at times they can be very positively correlated. They can have very positive beta and at times they'll have negative beta, right? But they're not yeah. guaranteed to have negative beta at the right time. And then I think the other thing that's going on over the last, since 09, right, right? Everyone made all that huge bleed. The shorter term your strategy is, everyone kind of morphed into more equities, long bias, longer time frame. Those were the things that lessened the bleed or even had a slight positive bleed. That was a survival strategy. Yeah. You know, nobody and stuck then, with the shorter term trend strategies because of that long term negative carry. You go through seven years of negative carry. You're in a 40% drawdown. You're going to answer to either investors or your or the board of directors. Good luck. Yeah. You want to be out of business or change your exactly. strategy. Yeah. Um, and then the, but to trend followers uh, defense, they didn't get whips out as much as I would have thought they did. Right. You, you would have think you'd seen tons of them come in and go short at those lows in size or whatnot, but it, they seem to manage that pretty well. So you don't see huge losses. You don't see huge gains, which investors might've expected, but from what well, we're seeing, yeah, I mean, we what, see. what happens, right, is the position sizes are smaller, right? Because yeah. the vol is so high that your position sizes are, are very, very small, even on, on the short side um, near the lows in March. So they were, most of them were caught offside. Some of them were caught offside for a while, but the position exposure was was low and vol came in so quickly that uh, I think that the, the losses were, were reasonable. And then energies helped a bit too. We mentioned it, the huge, unbelievable rally, which is still going on. Um, some of your favorite stories slash stats from that rally. And now I think we can also, which we touched on before, like get into the whole gamma story. I think, Adam, I've been mostly in your boat that that's kind of a good bedtime story, but not necessarily the whole picture. And it seems to have be, be becoming actually more and more of the actual picture. Um, so Jason, I'll throw it back to you. Just thoughts on the rally. Um, Sure, and, sure. and gamma. Yeah, I wanted to, you know, obviously we all, we all focus on markets, but one of my favorite uh, stats or, or least favorite stats from March in the real economy is, is close to home because my family owns a single screen theater. 
is that box office in the week of March 20 to 20, uh, March 20th to March 26th was $5,000. And the year prior was 205 million domestically to give oh. you an idea of like the full stop that we went through just to remind ourselves like how crazy both the markets and the real economy and dealing with COVID was at the time. That was like some um, theater in South Dakota or something. Like yeah. <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea where that 5,000 came from. Right. I want to know um, those people. So then you're talking about the recovery. One, one of my, and I, I think all of us on this call have a penchant for Schadenfreude is that unfortunately, and I guess I just mixed my French and German <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> Is the uh, when people started buying Zoom, Z O O M, thinking it was Zoom, Z M, the the teleconferencing, call, like just to give you an idea of like, I always worry about people's lack of due diligence and people just hitting the buy button on and not doing any diligence on what they're actually buying during the rally. For sure. That gives you, gives you an idea of that. But going to answer your question about Gamma, so it's come back into vogue, I think, this idea of focusing on dealer hedging, right? Whether it's, Gamma, Vanna, or Charm flows, and it's become part of the zeitgeist, at least in our corners of FinTwit these days. And but I think honestly, like people like uh, Charlie McGilligut at Nomura have been banging that drum for a long time. You know, a lot of people have been talking about that. And the thing is, you you can get an idea, right? If if you get exacerbated moves or you get vol being pinned on whether the dealers are you know short gamma or long gamma, but it's a it's a static snapshot, right? And that can flip so quickly. And it's just one explaining factor right like none of not, if it predicted the future those traders would be crushing it right now right but it doesn't necessarily predict the future and so it's become in vogue again and it is partially you know um you do have to pay attention to those flows but to you know adam just point that you know now i think the the derivatives market is is 20 trillion real value i'm not talking about notional value 20 trillion real value of, of, of derivative contracts and so it is becoming the tail that wags the dog i like to think about it in much more simplistic terms that for the last you know 20 years i've been thinking about this as as we become more financialized and derivatives become more and more part of the market and people are searching and searching for more yield you used to be able to almost like hedge your equities with cash, right? If you think about Harry Brown's permanent portfolio, mm -hmm. but now the derivative exposure has become so large that you need a comp, uh, convex derivative to hedge it. So almost like you don't have cash anymore because derivatives are tail that wags the dog. So when they crash, they crash so quickly. If you need to hedge, you need another derivative that has a similar level of convexity to hedge that because this, this notional exposure and then the real exposure of those derivatives may potentially be the tail that's wagging the dog. And I'm sure we're going to get to it, but part of it is, you know, call buying by retail traders or, or whales coming in for equity replacement. And so you do, unfortunately, even if you are just say, a value equities manager, you kind of have to give a little bit of an eye to the macro outlook of how these derivatives are moving markets. And I think, yeah, I wanted to get that, like part of it's got to be the stimulus in the around the world, right? Not just US of like, hey, citizens, here's this money to help save your lives. We're not all rational beings who stock up the pantry. We're going to be like, cool, here's this free money from the government. I'm going to go buy Z-O-O-M calls. <laughs> I'm going to even buy the wrong calls, right? But they're going to put that money to work. So I think that's a big piece of it. Um, I've said with some of these option guys on the podcast, where like, are we in the golden age of access to options? Probably, right? Like every platform in the world, anyone can open an account, a few clicks and buy an option. Like in the old days, not even five years ago, you had to probably go through a few extra hoops, sign some extra forms. I would hopefully think you had to do a little bit more education. Um, so I think all those factors are coming into, yeah, have driven that from those lows up to where we've gotten. I think we're all old enough to remember the heydays of the late 1990s. You know, I remember being able to call in option trades from, I remember I was a camp counselor one summer and I was calling in options trades from a, <laughs> from a pay phone nice. while, while, while the kids were playing stock? war in the field, you know. Are these I, on Toronto Stock Exchange? No, these were, these were on like Mindspring yeah. and, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, s some of these big uh, tech names in, in 98, 99. And it was, uh, these were, these were crazy days. So, but for uh, sure you were in the top 1%. I don't think everyone was doing that and had the ability to call in options. Right. And yeah. I was doing the same thing. <laughs> and so like, and I'm sure Jeff was doing the same thing. So like, that's, what's great about now everybody wants to bash the Robin hood traders. I'm not saying as a pejorative because we were all there, right. In yeah. late nineties, we were young guys buying these calls, getting rich, thinking we were geniuses, yeah. but then you learn about markets, right? So it's your entree. So it's great. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, but I, we definitely saw 
um, option enthusiasm in the late 1990s that is in the ballpark of what we're seeing today on the single name stock call option, um, you know, metrics. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's not a different order of magnitude anyways, right? So we have seen some, some portions of this movie before. I think I like this idea that, that dealer gamma and signals from the option market are more informative today, maybe than they were in, in some years past, but that they're not the only thing that's informing um, potential market direction, right? I mean, one of the changes that we've made in the last six months or so is we have directly incorporated some features from the different vol markets in as, as explanatory variables in our machine learning models, right? So, you know, the, um, the, the slope and, and, uh, uh, and depth and curvature of the VIX futures market and, and the, uh, you know, the move uh, index and a variety of other, like the, the uh, crude oil options curve, a variety of different markets end up explaining moves in a variety of other markets. You know, the curvature of the um, vol surface in crude explains the moves in treasury futures over the next five or 10 days. You know, like there's, there's, there's information to be gleaned from these markets that um, are not obvious if you don't have the right tools to be able to, you know, ferret out how the relationships play out. And uh, we, we probably, or we, no, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you straight out, that just wasn't on our radar to the same degree prior to this recent episode, right? It's just that because of the size of the derivatives market, that ends up, and, and because the other thing that derivatives have that cash markets don't is that they're all forward looking. So you've got trade, you're directly observing how traders are placing their bets and the probabilities of different scenarios according to the way that the that the bookmakers are um, are seeing the world, and you're able to use an aggregation, an ensemble of those views, to inform your own positioning. If you have good tools to determine how those uh, trader positions, what they imply about how you should be positioned, and I think um, if you're not using that information, that that's a major missing link that I think um, many investors should consider adding to their arsenal. So two things: that one. Are they really? I know they're technically forward-looking, but how many speculators, hedge funds, everything? I right, they're trading that just to make money over the next hour or something. So I don't know if I'm buying an e-mini or this call option or that, and I'm actually forward-looking and providing information to the market. I, I could argue that either way. We don't need to go down that that. Well, I path. think again at the aggregation level, for every yeah. for every buyer, there's a seller. For every seller, there's a hedge book, um, and that hedge needs to be offset in the cash market, right? So you've got stuff like um, the Dix index, right? What what type of activity is playing out on some of these uh, DIX, dark exchanges? Those uh, teenagers listening. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, I, I remember tweeting um, as we observed this Dix index move down into tenuous territory a few weeks ago, limp Dix sink, sink ships. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, so I, I, I think that there's, a, there's some of these um, more peripheral indices that have come into sharper focus recently and that in our um, research do provide a, 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 a dimension of information that is at an acute angle from some of the more traditional features that investors look at and I think can be really helpful in a portfolio context. Right. And it's, it's in essence the same thing as crude builds and the USDA report, and right? It's kind of a supply view. It is, um, but at a that, higher frequency. And, and I think- And it's not as accurate, although I would be hesitant to say the USDA reports are accurate, but huh. sure. but it's it's an estimate based on where different options were bought and sold, right? They, they don't really know what the banks, what the deal, I guess- No, no this, you're right. You don't know exactly who is on which side of the trade. You can sort of infer um, and make some generalizations. And you're right, there's an error term there. And then what do you think about, right? 15 years ago, we had all the banks- we're doing this and they've gone out of the game. They've gotten regulated out of the game. This is kind of a uh, unintended consequences, right? Of th now there's just basically Citadel, Susquehanna, a few different players that are pro being these market makers everyone talks about yep. um, and doing this gamma hedging. So that to me is a kind of a societal 
issue or like a little bit of a red flag of like, do we really want all this power? Uh, and they're just trying to protect their capital, but they're going to act in their best interest, not necessarily the market's best interest. That's a whole nother societal question, whether the market's best interest is in the society's best interest. But you know what I'm saying? Have we, yeah. have we over concentrated to these few names and now they're just pushing the market wherever they need to, to hedge their profits? Well, I think, in, you know, in, in large part, right, because the dealers don't, aren't able to carry um, any, any material risk budget on their own books, that they are now forced to offset that risk into the market, right? So that risk gets diffused into the market itself. And there may be some reflexive dimensions to this decision to not allow banks to, to take some of that risk on their books at times. Yeah. Um, because they ended up being some ballast, I think, at times yeah. when they were able to capitalize on dislocations and opportunities, and now they're not able to to carry any risk and take advantage of those opportunities. And if it, if the market is left to its own devices, m- most of the time that works well. But there are are times like March where the markets in themselves are just not functioning and they're not able to play that role. And we were talking with uh, Ben Eifert actually was bringing this up, like back in the old days, you could kind of the banks would do stupider trades, right? Like, I feel like we've progressed as a financial community where the risk people are much smarter. And now it's like, no, you can't go home now. You have to hedge that risk out. Mm-hmm. Whereas they used to kind of, as you're saying, warehouse that risk either accidentally or on purpose because the regulations allowed, you know, maybe the regulations allowed it. So the banks didn't care to monitor the risk as clearly. Um, but I mean, either I way, I think- back when I started trading, we, we had- everyone had an omnibus account, right? You could hold inventory and yeah. you could earn P and L on trading the inventory. And, and, you know, those, those days are gone. And, and because of that, you don't have those traders with, with bank sized wallets on the other side who are seeking to arbitrage and have the, the capital to do so. And it's also, I've brought up before, like if you right, like who's the guy that's going to sell um, Ackman those CDS next time. So like, you can only hang these people to dry so many times with like, oh, I, I got that for super cheap. They sold to me. They're idiots. They sold that vol to me. Like eventually well, the price- who is- sold those CDS is somebody who is desperate for carry, right? Yeah. Like they were looking to earn 27 million a month. And where where can you earn 27 million a month in, in the current market environment in order to generate the 7% annualized that you need in order to meet your pension obligations? Like it's a- uh, the, 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 the fact is it's an impossible scenario and we, we Unless try to YouTube shotgun influence. blame, but really the, the blame is like needs to be evenly distributed among all market participants. We all got here together. Yeah, and part of that's like the, the unintended consequences of Dodd-Frank, right? If you take that risk off of the, the, the prop desks at the banks is you had an enormous liquidity back then, but also the bid ass spreads were pretty wide. And now bid ass spreads have come down, but the liquidity is only maybe at one and two sigma events. And then they're going to take away that risk if, if things go haywire. So it's like yeah. there's trade offs on both sides. It used to be that you'd say that about the banks, right? What's a bank? Someone who will give you an umbrella when it's sunny and take it back when it's raining, right? Yeah. And now it's the same. Now it's the same with the, the high frequency traders, the market makers. It also seems to me there's not a never ending supply of retail call buyers, right? or even institutional call buyers. Like if they're, and those market makers are pushing the prices up, pushing the prices up, which is driving everything up. And they're gonna, you know, those trader, those people buying the call options have overpaid. Although I can go both ways on this because the markets come up into their strikes, but perhaps the market, they have the direction right, but the volatility wrong, so they're losing money on those. So like well, how right, many- You're right in both going, ways though, right? The, the first time, you know, these, this, this rise of Wall Street bets and Robin Hooders and YOLO trading, is they actually beat the market makers the first time they moved in mass into single name calls, right? The, yeah. the market makers kind of got their face ripped off and their gamma hedging, you know, exacerbated the move, but it's not going to happen a second time, right? They're going to get ahead of those gamma hedges. They're going to overcharge for those options. And now those Robin Hood traders and Wall Street bets are going to figure out what fixed strike ball means and that you're overpaying on the volatility side of those options. You may be directionally right, but you lost money. So those things come back into line. But at the same time, we're seeing, you know, whales buying, you know, call call spreads and call options as equity replacement. And that's a totally different, you know, Vega trade over the longer term. And they got now they got to hedge those Vanna flows. And they're they're buying the call replacements just a risk strategy, right? Of like, hey, I'm worried about owning the stocks outright because it could drop another 30%. 
the vaccine starts killing people, whatever happens. Like, I'm worried I'm just going to spend premium instead of spending the whole cash out. And so, like you said about looking at like these flows as maybe looking at the wrong metric, or maybe it's part of your metric ensemble that you look at is a lot of people look at like put call ratio, right? And right now it's exceedingly low. So people are like, oh, it's a risk on environment. Well, you have to think about what put call ratio is and the calls are the denominator. So it's more of a function of call buying, right? And so if you have whales out there buying calls and call spreads as an equity replacement, you're going to go, that's, that's saying risk on and put call ratio, but it's actually saying risk off. They're taking off the downside risk of, of an equity replacement trade. So you have to like think, think about like second and third order effects to these things. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't understand the value of, of, buying calls instead of only cash and buying puts, you know, like there's the, there's a parody there that it's, <laughs> is it, is it legitimately cheaper to do that? Maybe it is because I haven't looked at the relative cost of, uh, of hedging with, with puts at the moment relative to just selling the cash and buying the calls. But, um, well, traditionally guess, it wasn't right. The puts were overpriced because people would buy them for protection. Yeah. Quote yeah, unquote yes. overpriced, but, um, Yeah. Let now me, we're seeing uh, call skew in the single name. So now the call skew is getting overpriced. But also, um, Jeff, going back to like, what's your story of this rally? And I think we'd be remiss or I would be if I didn't mention part of what came into the Overton window of the zeitgeist. And you guys actually both, I'm not going to create any animosity here. You both <laughs> had two of the best podcasts with Mike Green I've ever heard. Perfect. We got to talk to him about very variable things. But what's come into, the, into vogue this year is, is Mike Green's passive thesis. And that may be what's driving the rally in this market of 401k flows of target date funds just hitting that buy button. And those flows never stopping because even during a COVID slowdown, it was more the managerial class still had to inflows those 401ks and, and vanguards and the Black Rocks and their target date funds are still hitting that buy button. And we're seeing that on those monthly or quarterly rolls in that, you know, a lot of times the third week of the month and at the end of the quarter. Yeah, the 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 seasonality in markets right now, I mean, it's, it is kind of uncanny how many reversals over the last three years have come on quarter end roll dates, you know, like it really is pretty amazing. So it's, it's hard to argue against the assertion that there is something meaningful going on at, at quarter end and uh, the sheer size of some of these target date funds um, certainly would argue that, that they're having a, an outsized impact on um on moves at the end of quarters. And I mean, so there's been some really, really cool new papers out just in the last six months or so that are really trying to get at the impact of flows in markets. And, and they've all concluded, I think, to a paper that the the impact of it, I've, I've seen a range from sort of like the impact of $1, $1 of flows uh, is the equivalent of a, of a $3 um, move in in the, in the underlying. So it's like that just, just the sourcing of liquidity drives a much larger move than you would expect given the size of the, of the flow and different market participants have an outsized um, impact. So buybacks. That's Mike example, Green's thing. Like much, you're trying to take all this money and stick it through this little pipe. You got to make the pipe bigger, which is the price. But what exactly. Adam's saying too, is like the papers like by uh, like Vincent Delaware that's combining flows uh, QE and, and stock options is like, it, they're kind of fascinating reciprocity. Buybacks. Like he's saying, it's creating a perpetual motion machine of higher yep. stock. But I'm wondering, Adam, how do you, like we think about it often, obviously for the fragility that creates the markets that melts up and melt down when you're trading, you know, option straddles or strangles, but how do you factor those into the models that you're building? Well, I, there's a, there's a first order impact, which is it, it obviously creates these very large statistically significant, uh, seasonality effects, which you can, um, which, which you can identify. Um, and then I think you've just got to be, um, more aware of, of your active bets coming into the end of quarters, right? Like, uh, this is where some of the cross market stuff plays out, right? So if you've got cross market seasonality, maybe that the S and P seasonality doesn't just give you information about what to expect from the spoos, but also to, to what, what to expect from treasury markets. Because a lot of this comes, comes about from a rebalancing effect. You've had a major move down in equities relative to bonds in the quarter. Well, you've got these, these huge funds that now need to uh, sell bonds and buy equities. Or you know, in, in the reverse dynamic, if you've had a huge sell down in, in bonds and a massive rally in equities, you've got to sell equities, equities and buy bonds. So you've got these cross market effects that you... Um, 
can also take advantage of that, that relate to seasonality. And I, I think you, you can also account for some of these seasonality effects in your estimation of risk, right? So your estimate of, of vol, are you expecting vol to come in or expand towards the end of these periods? And there's, there's information. When you say there. seasonality, you mean the target dates, the flows are coming in at a certain time. Yeah, they're, they're, they're coming in. Maybe it's around OPEX. Maybe it's around the end of the quarter, even in a quarter yeah. rebalancing. Not like I mean, the Santa Claus rally or sell in May and go away. So, so, so that's that's one. But I mean, if you look at the, when did the market turn in March? Well, it yeah. turned uh, at the expiration of March OPEX, right? And March right. was also quarter end. And so you had these two major events that were um, positive feedback uh, impacts on one another. And so, you know, I, I think that, needs to be pointed to, or at least identified as, as a potential major catalyst for that reversal and why it happened when it did. Do you think that starts to self-correct or like if I'm one of these target day funds, I might do some analysis and be like, Hey, we're kind of getting slippage at the end of each quarter. Cause we're all rushing in. Like, let's start layering in over the quarter and like, you'll get some of those effects over time. Right? You'd think so. You know, and, and we've actually analyzed that. I went and, and, or we can all start front running. Or yeah. Yeah. But, but I mean, Vanguard rebalances every day. So yeah. it's, it's not like the Vanguard funds um, are they at the big? margin are responsible here. And so, you know, again, this also may be um, structured products. Like there's, you just, you don't really know at any given moment what, what the actual end agent is that is causing these dynamics. But the, this seasonality is just an unbelievably powerful, economically and statistically significant phenomenon in markets and it's timeless. I mean, it's, if we go back and look at the features that are explanatory, seasonality is one of the most persistent, sustainable, and powerful explanatory features in markets that no one ever talks about. It's like voodoo or astrology or yeah. something. But, but well, because oftentimes it gets tied in with like moon cycles or something. And then people are like, ah, I don't know about that. That's right. right. If you it's know, like, and it doesn't no, need to be calendar effects, the, so it can be. Right. If it's like people get paid these dates and the, you know, they get their 401k and then it goes into the market. Like that's a track trackable thing. Absolutely. People don't get paid on the second Tuesday of every month or something. Um, and then also on this target date concept, eventually they go to zero stocks, right? Well, yeah, right. But or not but, zero, but some some lower, right? They ramp down as the people get older. So as our whole society gets older, doesn't this whole narrative flip? And we well, start- You've also got the inheritance, right? So somebody, selling. somebody passes away- and now you've got a fund that was was previously 80% bonds, 20% stocks, getting inherited by somebody in their 30s or 40s who are then reinvesting those funds into a, a target date fund that's now 70% stocks and 30% bonds, right? Because of their age category. So mm, I so think there's some redistribution dynamics that may offset some of that. And Adam, Adam, do you know too? I think over time too, they've changed the rules. It used to be 60 40, then it went 70 30, then it's like 80 20. Like, so the amount of equities they're holding could, to hit their target date returns, you know, it's changed over time. It hasn't been set in stone for the last 30 years. No, for sure. And I, you know, some of the research in retirement funding has um, argued for a higher equity allocation. And I think a lot of this, you know, I was, I was just having a conversation on Twitter last night with some guys that I, that I deeply respect, but I, I, I consistently believe that, that people, and when, when I say people, I mean advisors, but I also mean Vanguard and, and iShares and DFA and, and a lot of these firms that create these target date structures place far too much faith in the empirical distribution that we've observed in equities and bonds and that the risk in equities much maybe considerably larger than, than they think and the um, equity allocation that they're advocating for because the historical return to equities has been so much larger than bonds um, is probably substantially overdone. So- Well, and I mean, the really bond offset like might not be there too, right? Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we can get into just How the complete um, farce that is the 60-40 portfolio in terms of, of its ability to manage- the right tail of inflation risk. I was just quick thought of like how how long until we get some of those target dates are like no we need one hundred and twenty percent stocks, right? Like that's for sure going to be in the card someday. If someone like cool, I can't compete with Vanguard. I'm going to amp it up and and give a little extra stock low. Well, I mean it's it's already a bit of a big 
question mark. If you have a withdrawal expectation of 4% and the expect Vanguard is expecting equity returns over the next 10 to 15 years of between three and 5% nominal. Um, I mean, can you even achieve your distribution objectives with a hundred percent equities? No, right. I don't do math for a living, but it doesn't seem like that works, right? Um, and that's one of the pensions are saying too, right? They're they're saying I'm going to apply leverage now. That was their move instead of like. Yeah, and you know this leverage gets a a really bad bad rap, right? You know if. I mean, the irony is, of course, if you own the S&P, you own two to one leverage because the S&P is is levered about two to one in terms of debt to equity. So it's not like you're avoiding leverage by owning stocks, right? You can either own leverage by levering or by, by concentrating in your equity portfolio, or you can gain leverage by diversifying your portfolio and, and getting the leverage explicitly. Um, and but I've you've got you- leverage either way. I've heard you or Rodrigo have said like, or you could buy a volatile stock or you could buy a less volatile stock. That's right. And that's one way of applying leverage as well. Yeah. Hi everyone, as mentioned at the start, we split this conversation into two pods. So we're gonna break here and come back next week with the second half. We'll see you next week. Happy holidays. You've been listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at RCMAlt and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at RCMAlt.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you.